Christ, and I pray as David did in Psalm 19. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The title of my sermon today is True Wisdom. What is it? And how does it apply to my life? Well, Miriam Webster says this, Wisdom is knowledge that is gained by having many experiences in life. It's also the natural ability to understand things that most people cannot understand. And then thirdly, she says, knowledge of what is proper or reasonable, good sense or judgment. Now, Socrates says, true wisdom comes to us, each of us, when we realize how little we understand about life, ourselves and the world around us. Martin Luther says this, there is no wisdom save truth. Truth is everlasting, but our ideas about truth are changeable. Only a little of the first fruits of wisdom, only a few fragments of the boundless heights, breaths, and depths of truth have I been able to gather. The author of our reading today, James, says, Wisdom comes down from above. And Jesus, in his sharing with his disciples, says, This wisdom from above. Whoever, if, if anyone would be first, he must first be, he must be last of all and servant of all. Well, in preparing for today's message, I concentrated on James. And I made a list of the qualities of the kind of, of the two kinds of uh, wisdom that he uh, talks about. The earthly wisdom and the wisdom from above. Now, um, as soon as I get this to work, there we go, whoops, let's go back. This is a first for me to do this in the pulpit, so please be, <laughs> be uh, uh, patient with me. There we go. Now here are the qualities of both earthly and heavenly wisdom. Now earthly wisdom, according to James, James is bitterly jealous. It's selfishly ambitious. It's arrogant. It's envious. It's double-minded. It's murderous. It's unspiritual. And it's even demonic. <coughs> Heavenly knowledge, however, is pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, merciful, and free of prejudice and hypocrisy. Which one would you like to draw upon? I remember thinking about wisdom and talking about wisdom in seminary. And one of the things that we talked about was the difference between wisdom and knowledge. What is the difference between the two? Well, wisdom is the principle. Knowledge is the practical application. Okay? Guess what? God has both. Okay? So, I would rather draw from a person or, per, or a being such as God, a pure, peaceful, gentle, open to reason, merciful, and free of prejudice and hypocrisy, than someone who is out for themselves, who is selfishly ambitious, which we all are. So which wisdom is better? I, I believe the one from heaven. Now, does that wisdom, wisdom make sense? Probably not. Probably not to us. But, let's see. Now, the results. In earthly wisdom, the results are disorder, every evil practice, quarreling, disputes, and our desires are at war within ourselves. The result of heavenly wisdom is peace, righteousness, and good fruits. Good stuff. We like this. We like the heavenly wisdom. We want to be there. But we aren't. We're usually over on the other side. 
Now James gives us a formula for how to go from the earthly wisdom to the heavenly wisdom. And the first thing he says is, submit and draw near to God. The second thing he says is, resist the devil. <coughs> the third thing he says is, cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. Well, Jesus embodies all of this. All of these things listed in heavenly wisdom, as well as he teaches them to his disciples. When Jesus, is sees, when Jesus sees his disciples are displaying the qualities of earthly wisdom, Jesus gives them heavenly, heavenly advice. Whoever, if anyone be first, he must be last of all, his servant of all. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Jesus even puts his earthly and heavenly wisdom puts earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom into stark relief by telling his disciples, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. What kind of Messiah is that that dies? What kind of Messiah is delivered into the hands of men? But notice what he says. He, after three days, he will rise. Does that make sense to you? Have you ever seen anybody rise from the dead? I mean, it, it sounds crazy, right? But this is what Jesus says. Notice that the disciples didn't understand him when he was talking like this, and they were afraid to ask him. They were steeped in earthly wisdom and couldn't bring themselves to think about these statements from another perspective. That is God's perspective. How different these two types of wisdoms are. God's wisdom and logic define, and God's wisdom and logic defies our own wisdom and logic. It puts our own reasoning upside down. That is why we must depend on him, because we inevitably will get things wrong. We will hurt people. I want to tell you a story about a guy. His name is George Mueller. We studied him in seminary. And George Mueller... Um, was a Christian evangelist. He was the director of something called the Ashley Down Orphanage in Bristol, England. He cared for 10,000 orphans in his life. He was well known for providing an education to the children under his care to the point where he was accused of raising the poor above their station. He also established 117 schools which offered Christian education to over 120,000 children, many, many of them being orphans. He did all this by relying on the living God, by prayer. Now George didn't, out, didn't start out being a good guy. At the age of five or six, George, well, first of all, George was born in 1805, so we're talking about a 19th century guy. And his parents were pretty wealthy. Um, he, at the age of five or six, he, would, he started stealing from his, parent, from his father, from his wallet. And uh, then, uh, as he grew older, he started lying about that. He started stealing from others. Um, he became a drunkard. Uh, his father was so concerned about him, he wanted to advise him about getting a job. He says, well, why don't you become a preacher? Because if, you're, if you become a pastor, the state will take care of you, and you only work one day a week. Okay? In those days in Europe, and still today, uh, church, uh, church is a state institution, and it's like the post office here. You get paid by the state. Anyway, so this is going to be his, his, his job. So he goes to seminary, and he's really, really smart. 
but he doesn't read any scripture. Nothing. He meets some guy. Uh, he learns all the theology. He learns all the, you know, liturgy and stuff like that. Well, he meets a guy in seminary, and this guy actually followed Christ. Um, he, this guy asked him to come to a meeting with him. And so he did. He went to this prayer meeting with this guy. George is there, and these people were praying. And they prayed as if they were talking to somebody who was living, who was standing right next to them. And he was just, he never heard such prayer. So, uh, he decided he was going to go back to that meeting, and he was going to convince everyone that Jesus wasn't real, God wasn't real. So he kept going back and arguing and kept going back and arguing. And finally, he became a Christian. <laughs> he did. He started believing in the living God. He started having a relationship with the living God by talking to him and listening to him through prayer. He then decided that he wanted to go to Austria, but God had different plans for him. God said, you are going to England. He goes to England. He goes to this small church fishing in a fishing town. And this small church uh, had a whole different system of paying their, their preachers and pastors. What they did was they, they had pew rent. Okay? They paid everybody by, you know, pe uh, people who came to church would pay, pay rent for their pews. And he said, when he got there and he got to be the senior pastor, he says, I'm, we're not doing that anymore. Besides, if you're going to charge pew rent, you should charge pew rent to the back half of, of the church so that people will sit in the front half of the church for free. <laughs> well, he decided to throw that whole system out, and he decided that he was going to rely on God for his salary. So the first time it happened... He, he prayed. He said, you know, Lord, all I need is I need enough money to resole my shoes. That'll take about a, a shilling. So they passed the hat. They had this locked box. And he got in that box that first day one shilling to take care of his, his boots. He went on and on to pray for his provision and needs. He got married, uh, had children, uh, God always provided because George was in God's will. George knew God. George knew God was living and real. Well, George was given another task. He went to the big city. Well, during that time, the cholera epidemic was just raging. People were dying left and right. There were thousands and thousands of orphans in Bristol, England. Now, what they did with the orphans during that time was that they would put them in jail because they had no parents, right? So the only way they could do that is put them in jail or put them in a sanitarium or a hospital. When, you know, what did they learn there? Well, they learned to be criminals in jail. They learned to be crazy in the sanitarium, right? Well, George saw this and he prayed and he prayed for a uh, building he prayed for children, and he wanted girls. He said, girls will be easy to, easy to, to handle. <laughs> Little did he know. <laughs> but at any rate, he got, he got like 30 girls, and um, they started this, uh, this orphanage. Before long, he had 2,000 children and three buildings. And he did this all through prayer all through his relationship with Jesus Christ. That's all he did was depend on Jesus for this. Now, of course, he had to listen to Jesus. He had to know what God's will was for his life. But he did. Amazing things happened. His wife and him, they hawked their jewelry, their wedding jewelry. They had no money left. They had 2,000 children they had no way to provide breakfast, lunch, or dinner for these children. They prayed, and they prayed all night. 
lo and behold, the next morning when the kids were in the dining hall, a milk truck broke down in front of their orphanage. The guy comes in and says, can you guys use some milk? You know, I, it's going to take a long time to get this, this truck or this trailer or whatever it was. Maybe it was a horse-drawn tra trailer, probably. But anyway, it, it'll take a long time. My milk will spoil. So they had milk. And George says, my kids can't live just on milk. <laughs> Lord, what's going to, you know, they need more. The next thing that happens, there's a knock on the door. A baker comes in with all this bread that he had baked. God woke him up in the middle of the night and said, bake bread. The orphanage needs it. And he did. And they were fed that day. Another time, the boiler broke down. And they said it was going to take three weeks to fix. And George says, my kids, they're going to freeze to death. Well, the team of workers came in and they said, well, if we work around the clock, it'll be only three days. You know, we can fix this thing. So they turned off the, the, the boiler, but George was praying the whole time saying, you know, Lord, my kids need heat. They're going to get sick. They're going to die. The wind, this was a winter day. It was in February. The wind changed and came from the south. And it stayed warm for three days. And then as soon as the boiler was fixed, it went back to normal. You see, we, we are privileged to be believers in the living God. We are privileged to, to rely on his wisdom. He created everything. George is a living example of this. He was. He, he's now dead. 1805, he's got to be dead by now. No, he is. But I, I would really like you to read this book. It's just a short book. It's the autobiography of George Mueller. Very good. And George Mueller also uh, has a, a website, georgemueller.org. I will uh, put the uh, link to that website on our Facebook page, and you'll be able to uh, listen to a guy who is portraying George and telling about his stories. And I think you will be just amazed. <coughs> now, I think I have one more slide. There's George. Look at him. He's an old guy, but he's got a, only God can put that sparkle in your eye. That's right. But anyway, there it is. There's the book, if you're interested. Um, our seminary uh, picked it up for all the staff members. Uh, we as, as students all read it. And uh, it's just a living testimony to how God lives and works in our world today. And still does, just as he does in the scripture. So let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for being a God who wants to be with us, work with us, be in us, talk to us, uh, and show us the way. Lord, because if we're, we had our way, we'd be going down the wrong road. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your wisdom. Thank you for embodying the wisdom from above that makes no sense to us, but makes sense to the one who made us. Holy Spirit, Stir within each one of us and remind us that Jesus is there, he's living, that our, the Father is there, he's living, and you are living within us, that we can rely on you, have a relationship with you, speak with you, and amazing miracles will happen. Only good happens when, when we rely on you, Lord, because you are the only good in the universe. And we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 May I share something at this time with the congregation? Certainly. Stand when, up. In your sermon, when you talk about the miracles of God, um, I asked God, I said, God, do you still heal today like you did in the biblical days? And so I went into a search of that. 
and Charles and Francis Hunters were in Hastings, Minnesota, and I went and I listened to them. And people would hit the floor, and you'd think they'd crack their heads wide open. And anyhow, I thought, and I was so intent on watching that, and all of a sudden I felt the heat on my back, and it was hot, and it was moving, but I was too intent on listening to what was going on out there. So I let it go. Well, that was in the 80s. And so in 1999, in fact, in the fall of 98, I had a problem, and I doctored all winter down in Texas. And I went through so many tests and so on, I'd walk in and say, well, okay, what's next? But you know what? God was with me the whole time. When this happened, I came, became shook for a half hour. And in that half hour, I became very peaceful, and I knew that God had his hand on me and that I was going to be fine. I knew exactly what was going to happen, that I was going to have cancer, uterus cancer. And so we came home, and we <clears throat> anyhow, the doctor down south said to me, I'll take you into surgery tomorrow because you are precancerous. I said, if I didn't already know that I have to go back home for this, I would let you do it. But I said, I know that I need to go back home. We got home on the 7th of April. My dad went into a coma on that Wednesday, and he died the following Saturday. And then the doctor said, don't go any longer than three weeks. The doctor here, I brought everything back with me. He put me out for seven weeks. And I felt it the day it went into cancer. And yet God was with me, God touched me, and he healed me. Amen. And on my back, the doctor said to me, do you realize that your one kidney, is right kidney is shaped different than the left kidney? Like a wave came at me and said, this is what I did for you that day in 1980-something. That is the healing hand of the Lord. And I tell you people, when I pray for people that God wants prayer for their sicknesses, how do you feel about it? Where are you at with it? You can get all the prayers in the world, but you, that's between you and God. And there's where it's at. Yep. Call on the Lord. He is so good to us. Amen. 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 Thank uh, you. Mess, my message is not necessarily to pray more, but to have a relationship with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, we go on with our um, uh, sermon hymn. Rise up, O saints of God. So stand up and rise up. 